Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's video is a tabletop review and comparison of an original M1A1 Thompson submachine gun, fully automatic and transferable, and the new modern reproduction, if you will, semi-automatic closed bolt configuration also made by Auto Ordnance. We will go through a brief history and then a point-by-point -point comparison of the two both following on the characteristics of each as well as their function so you can see if you are interested in getting one of the modern semi-automatic closed bolt auto ordnance Thompsons, how closely it really does resemble an original open bolt submachine gun Thompson. Anyway, if that all sounds interesting to you, please stick around, that's coming up now. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a general comparison of the two. So the original M1A1 Thompson did have a barrel length of about 10 inches, and the Auto Ordnance remanufactured version has a barrel length of 16 and a half inches. Of course, that is because of our laws and the SBR laws, where you can purchase this as just a Title I firearm over the counter at your dealer's gun store without doing any NFA type of paperwork. Now, Auto Ordnance does make both a pistol variation of this, which comes with the 10 inch barrel and without a stock, which you can then form one and convert into an SBR if you want to do that, or they have an SBR ready-made, which is exactly in this configuration, but of course, all NFA laws will apply. You will have to go through the uh, tax stamp and all of that to, to purchase that on a Form 4 as an NFA item. This is probably the most popular variant people purchase, so, you know, no NFA paperwork applies or anything, you do have the stock, you can take it and enjoy it as a carbine. So let's go ahead and get into that into a size comparison. So I'm going to do measurements from the front of the handguard on each so we can see what the general length is of the firearm itself and how close it is that they got. So on the standard M1A1 Thompson, we are at 30 inches. And on the remake, we are also at 30 inches, so exactly the same length. Now let's go from the bottom of the pistol grip all the way to the top of the receiver. Here we are at six and three quarters, and here we are at six and three quarters. So exactly the same there. Let's go ahead and take a look at the length of pull on an original. We are sitting at 16 and three quarters, and on the reproduction, we are at 17. So the length of pull on the remake is just about a quarter of an inch longer. Now bringing in the scale, weighing of course without a magazine, an original M1A1 Thompson is at 10 pounds, 10 ounces. And the modern semi-automatic, 10 pounds, 14 ounces. So we are at about four ounces heavier on this, which can very easily uh, be responsible for that extra six inches of barrel up here at the end. If this had the standard length barrel, I would pretty much venture a guess to say they would almost be at about the exact same weight. Now the material on both is a machined steel throughout the both upper and lower receiver and then you have an American walnut furniture set on both. Now the finish on both of these, so the standard M1 and M1A1 Thompson was finished in a military parkerizing, whereas on the modern semi-automatic variant, it is blued. They probably went ahead and did that because the original uh, Thompson, like the, the Tommy gun, the gangster gun, the 1921s and 1928s, those were originally blued. It was the military configurations that would have been parkerized. Since the modern or, uh, auto ordinance does still make all the other variants, they probably go ahead and blew all the receivers and, and the frames and everything just like that as a standard process to make it a little bit easier. Uh, it really does not detract too much on the look of the firearm. It's just more of a rich black color as opposed to a sort of a grayish, greenish, parkerized color as you would get it on an original M1 or M1A1 Thompson. So let's go ahead and start back here with the stock. This is the stock on the original M1A1 Thompson. It is a American walnut with a sort of a deep brown finish. Now back here on the back on the butt plate, which on this example is blued, uh, you do have a trap door, so keep that in mind. Also right here are inspector's markings. I believe that is MR, uh, the initials of whoever did the overhaul on this, on this stock there. Now there is a little bit of a difference in the angle uh, back here. There's a kind of a deeper cut back here in the comb and a little bit of a less sharp decline in the back of the stock here, which I noticed on the other auto ordnance, which I'll take a look at now, which here is sort of a shallower cut into the stock here and a little bit of a less aggressive cut back here in the comb of the stock. Now the butt plate here is of course also blue, just like the rest of the firearm, but you will notice there is no 
uh, there is no trap here in the back for any type of cleaning or, uh, kit or anything like that. Now back here on the side of the receiver, you will see it says Auto Ordnance Corporation, Bridgeport, Connecticut, USA. That was the location of the original plant as founded by John Thompson in 1916. Here on top is the iconic M1A1 sites, which are a stamped sheet metal, and then they're riveted in place up here at the top. Up here at the top as well, you will see the Thompson trademark logo as well. Now here on this side, you will see it also says Auto Ordnance Corporation, and it says Worcester, Massachusetts here, which is of course the location now. Now in 1999, Auto Ordnance was purchased by the parent company of Car Arms. And today they just make, you know, Thompson makes these semi-automatic versions uh, of these firearms or Auto Ordnance is what I meant to say. But um, anyway, just a little bit of history backstop there for you. So same name, different address. Now you will notice the stamped sheet metal rear sight here as well, which just has an aperture hole with a little notch on the top, which in this case is screwed into the top of the receiver. And you will see the little Thompson bullet emblem there on top of the receiver as well. Now one point of note is the these do have very drastic cutoffs here at the bottom of the stamped sheet metal sight, whereas on the original, it sort of slopes down into a point at the bottom. So a little bit different in design, but you're really not gonna notice unless someone like me points it out. Now back to the original Thompson on this side, the roll markings say Thompson submachine gun caliber 45 M1 with the serial number right below it. Now originally this would have been an M1, not an M1A1 Thompson. Difference is basically three. It would have just had a folding Lyman sight back here in the rear. The bolt is a little bit different, which I will show you on disassembly. And the selector lever switches are a little bit different too. Here you see kind of the two little knobs here with the little stems coming off of them. An M1 would have looked a little bit different. I will roll in a picture for you. Now on these two selectors, this one here toggles between safe and fire. And this one over here toggles between semi-automatic and fully automatic. So you do have two little switches here. Now, as mentioned, this was stamped originally M1. It would have gone through a re-arsenal process and gotten all of the later M1A1 updates. So the updated M1A1 rear sight would have been added and then the updated trigger uh, selectors. Actually, the entire frame is different. It's serialized, non-matching. So the frame was added, an M1A1 frame, also made by Savage though. And then the updates were made to the upper receiver, such as the inclusion of this rear sight. Now this still retains its original M1 bolt car carrier group, which again, when I disassemble, I will, will explain the difference. Now here on the auto ordinance one, it says Thompson semi-automatic carbine caliber 45 M1 and then the serial. So the layout is exactly different except it says Thompson semi-automatic carbine instead of Thompson submachine gun. Now here you're going to notice the exact same selectors, but here it's just safe and fire. You do not have a secondary selector for fully automatic or semi-automatic fire, which of course is to be expected because it is a semi-automatic only carbine. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the magazine release. And this is gonna be a little bit weird showing you upside down, but the mag release is right here. So you push up on that. You can see it's rotating a lever right here that I'm pointing at to with this finger. Now that allows this to then slide out. And you will see right here on the face here, as I pull that lever, that little notch retracts back and forth. That is what is locking into the back of the magazine here in this little hole. Now you do have a T rail on the back of the magazine, which corresponds with the T slot on the bottom of the magazine well. You just basically guide those two together and then push in and it'll lock itself in place. Now on the new semi-automatic Thompson, it works the exact same way. You just push up on that and it allows that to pop out. Sorry, I just bumped my tripod there. But all the other functions work exactly the same way. Now one question I know people are going to ask is will an original M1A1 Thompson magazine function and the semi-automatic copy. And the answer is, is it'll guide in, but it won't lock. So you do have to modify the location of the little locking tab. You can see the location is slightly different and the hole is a little bit larger on the updated magazine. Now, many of you may remember when I did a review and a comparison of the MP40 with the new uh, GSG semi-automatic MP40. The magazines were not interchangeable there as well. It's very interesting and I don't know why companies don't just make it so that they fit, you know, other magazines. It seems, that especially in this case, I kind of understood on the MP40, but in this case, it seems like it's just barely close enough to work and it just doesn't. Again, you can still buy these magazines and modify them. The sad thing is, is these are very 
very inexpensive. An original M1A1 or M1 Thompson stick mag will only run you between $20 and $30. So it would be nice, cool also to be able to just use kind of the worn out old M1 Thompson mags with the original you know, proof markings and everything on them. Would have been cool to be able to buy some if you had this carbine. Again, you still can, you're just gonna have to play around with them and modify them to work. But I wish that they just came you know, ready to accept both without modification. Moving into the handguards, of course, you just have the flat handguard here with a sling loop and little channels here for your fingers to grip into. And then the contour of the barrel is a little bit fatter towards the back, but tapers down towards the front. And then you have a very large and beefy front sight, which is non-adjustable. The modern semi-auto auto ordnance remake is exactly the same way and it feels exactly the same, just a little newer, of course. With the little slings swivel down here on the bottom. Now the barrel has the exact same tapering effect, but of course extends out way further to here. We're on the on the original Thompson, the barrel stops about right here. But then the sight is exactly the same, very beefy and not adjustable. So other than the barrel length, physically a very close representation. I mean, unless you get up right on top of them uh, from far away, you're honestly not gonna realize or notice a difference at all. Again, save for the barrel length difference. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the disassembly so we can see basically how close they got on the modern semi-automatic version to the open bolt submachine gun. Now, it's important to start and look at the functional difference here. So this is an open bolt submachine gun, as mentioned. And the principles are such that when you are ready to fire, you have to bring the bolt to the rear and it'll lock itself open on the sear. Now, when you pull the trigger, this will drop, allowing the bolt carrier to come forward, strip around, and fire. As long as my finger is here on the trigger, that action will continue. And when I let off the trigger, the sear engages the bolt carrier and it stops, but it's still in the open bolt position. Okay, the semi-automatic, we're going to pretend that this is a semi the uh, semi-automatic version, is when you chamber around, the bolt will go back, come forward, chamber around, and it'll rest in the forward position, ready to fire. Okay, just like you're used to with any other semi-automatic firearm that you may own. When you pull the trigger one time, the bolt will cycle, extracting and ejecting the casing, continue forward, stripping another round, chambering it, and it's ready again for another trigger pull. So that's the functional difference. Now, this is select fire, so you can engage it in a semi-automatic mode, but it will still fire from the open bolt position. So I will actually switch it over to semi-automatic and show you. So when I pull the trigger, and I'm still holding the trigger, it'll fire, go into recoil, and see I'm still holding the trigger, but it stops. When I let go, it resets, like a semi-automatic would, ready for me to pull the trigger. Again, I'm still holding the trigger, but it still locks open, ready to fire again. Okay, so you do have the selector capabilities there. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and disassemble the Thompson. So, you start off, there is a little button right back here under the back of the receiver. I'm going to use, because the receiver halves here are actually pretty tight, I'm gonna go ahead and use a punch to help me to press that, and then start to move the receiver just slightly so it depresses its own pin down on itself. Then I will go ahead and pull the trigger, which will allow the receiver to then start sliding off. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove a part of the sling here so that I have a little bit more space to work with, but like I said, it's really tight and I'm doing this upside down. Here, I'm gonna help myself and kind of pull it this way. Okay. And then that will separate my two halves there. Now, I'm going to stop at that point and then show you just to simply the other and then kind of how we get to that point on the other one as well. Now on the semi-automatic variant, disassembly is going to start in very much the same way. You do have a little, uh, little spring-loaded button here on the back of the receiver, just like you did on the original one. So you start by depressing that, pulling the trigger, and then sliding the two halves apart, just like we did on the original. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. All right, I got it started here off camera because it's really, really tight and I kind of had to hold it up and help me get it off. Now, there is a little channel here on the lower receiver uh, which you did not have on the other one and the little takedown notch on the bottom here does interfere with the trigger controls. So you do have to, when it gets to this point, you do have to sort of assist it in the upward position 
All right there, I finally got it apart and man, that was really a pain. <laughs> and just, that was really, really, really tight. I'm sure with some use, this will wear, really wear in. Now I did get this in use from a customer, but based on looking at it internally, I'm not even sure it was fired. If it was, maybe, I don't even think it's been disassembled. So uh, maybe it has maybe one time. But anyway, that was, that was a pain uh, compared to the original. So here I have both of the frames disassembled and out of their firearms. Um, and what you will see is on the lower trigger control, the, the fire control group is actually very similar in how they function. So starting over here with the fully automatic variant, what you will notice is of course, it's very smooth across the top. There's no cuts or channels or anything. And when you pull the trigger, this little arm right here drops down out of the way. Now that's going to connect with a shelf on the bolt carrier group. And the bolt carrier, of course, when you bring it to the rear and stop it, that's what it's resting on, that little sear bar. Now, of course, there's spring tension sitting behind the bolt. So when you pull the trigger, that drops out of the way, disconnecting from the bolt carrier and allowing the bolt to fly forward. And as long as your finger is holding down the trigger, that bolt will continue reciprocating and firing until you let go that lifts back up and then stops the bolt. Now bringing it in closer, you will notice right here is a little disconnector. And when I switch that over between semi-auto and full auto, the disconnector raises and lowers itself into way like that. So allowing it to catch the bolt and then reset when you release the trigger, it drops just like it would on a semi-automatic firearm, except it's holding it open in, in the uh, open bolt position. Now here on the semi-automatic variant, when you pull the trigger, you're doing very much a similar process, except you will notice that there is this channel cut right here. And what there is, is a firing pin on an independent spring inside the bolt. And the firing pin, there's a little notch that rides along this channel. And when the bolt comes into battery, the notch stays compressed on this little shelf here. So the bolt is in the forward position, yet the firing pin or the striker is retained to the rear. And when you pull the trigger, it drops that out of the way, allowing the striker to move forward. So on one, you have an open bolt where the entire bolt is held to the rear. On this, you have a closed bolt, but just the striker is held to the rear. So pretty interesting how that functions. And actually the principles of both are very similar. It was a very clever modification to maintain a very similar fire control group, but in a closed bolt machine gun or closed bolt semi-automatic carbine, if you will. Now here are the receivers with their bolts and guide rods and springs installed on both options. The fully automatic one here, as you can see, they look very similar. On the fully automatic one here, you have your bolt carrier group and then you have a single guide rod and spring and then your buffer here. On the semi-automatic version one, you have your bolt carrier group. You have your main guide rod and spring here, which is actually your firing pin spring. And, but you do have two external springs here working as sort of your main springs or your recoil springs. You also have a buffer here in the back retaining everything just as you do on the original. So other than a modification of making the firing pin or the striker work independently from the bolt, they are a very similar design. It's very interesting how close this actually is. Now bringing in the fully automatic one, here is that shelf that engages on the sear. So when this is brought back to the rear, it sits on that shelf. When you pull the trigger, it drops the sear, allowing it to fly forward and fire. And it will continue through that cycling pattern as long as your finger is held on the trigger and it's in fully automatic mode. Here's the buffer, which retains everything, which I will show you in a minute when I disassemble this. Here is a close up of the semi-automatic one. So you can see the bolt carrier can move and it's actually a lot of tension. This is a lot more tension on this than there is on the fully automatic one, but it reciprocates on these two guide, on these two recoil springs. But this one works independently and you can see the bottom of the striker here, and that's what rides in that channel and it moves independently on its own. So when all of these go back together, and they start to come forward, the bolt moves forward, but the striker stays, which has run through this channel here, and then stays engaged on that little sear. When you pull the trigger, you drop the sear, which then allows the striker to fly forward, strike in the back of the casing and firing the projectile. Everything goes into recoil again, cycles, this stays held to the rear, ready to fire, just like that. Now, disassembly here, you're gonna go ahead and hold in the guide rod and remove your buffer, which holds everything in place. 
and then sort of allow everything to start moving through the back of the receiver. Here's our mainspring and guide rod. Then the bolt will come here to this half moon notch on the side of the receiver where you can then, I have to depress on this part here to release the bolt handle. Then once the bolt handle is out, the bolt carrier itself moves out of the receiver and there it is. Now an interesting thing to show you about this is this is an M1 bolt, which is different than an M1A1 in one quick way. So an M1A1 bolt, the firing pin would just be machined as a single piece under the front of the bolt face here. This is your extractor. So that, like on an MP40 or, or a Mac-10 or an Uzi, when this goes into battery behind the casing, it just fires because it's got a fixed pin. Now this is an M1 bolt. That was one of the things they changed when they went from M1 to M1A1. As you can see as I move this, you can see through that little window, it works like a hammer. And what happens is this engages on the front of this, uh, the upper receiver shelf right here. What it does is when it goes into battery, it slams against the, that little shelf there in the receiver like that, causing that hammer to fly forward and strike the back of the firing pin, which then hits the casing. So a little bit more of a complicated design that was not necessarily necessary. Now this retains, this M1A1 retains its original M1 bolt. But again, they would have changed that to the M1A1 pattern with a fixed firing pin. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at disassembly of the upper receiver of the semi-automatic variant. So just like on the full auto, start by depressing in on the guide rod on the back of the receiver. Now you can grab either side of the recoil spring guide rods and just start lifting up. They are connected to the buffer in the back here. And just lift up and out. You can go ahead and pull those out. You can pull them off their guide rods or leave them, it's up to you. Now. That will allow the guide rod to come out the back, just like on an original full auto, and the spring as well. Now you can go ahead and bring the bolt back to that takedown notch, just like on an original, and go ahead and pull, pull that out, just like we did on the other. And then that will allow the bolt to just slide out of the receiver as well. Now in this bolt, there is a little, uh, what they call a hammer block or something along those lines. And of course, the firing pin or striker is in there as well. And it's free floating, of course, because this works as the firing pin spring. Now, if we look at these two components, an original versus the semi-automatic, they are very, very, very close in design. So again, everything about this, other than having to have simple modifications to make it a closed bolt semi-auto, functionally and characteristically, they're, I mean, you couldn't have really gotten it any closer. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you have any questions, leave those down in the comment section. If you would like to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. But anyway, guys, I will leave you with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.